Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at an introduction to the lungs, the trachea and bronchi, bronchioles, alveoli, and then we'll finish with a summary. So first of all, let's just talk about the lungs and introduce what they do. So mammals and larger animals require lots and lots of oxygen to be able to do what they need to do. And because of this, they produce a large amount of the gas carbon dioxide as well as a waste product. So these tend to be large organisms, which mammals are, for example, elephants or horses or humans. And even though cats and dogs are small, so are mice compared to elephants and humans, they're still considered large because of the number of cells that they have in their body. This is in contrast to smaller organisms like small animals like worms or algae and smaller cell organisms, which don't need a gas exchange system so much. So larger animals like mammals are using lots and lots of oxygen and they're producing lots and lots of CO2 as well, and therefore they need a gas exchange system, whereas smaller animals are doing this much less. As well as this, large mammals have a high metabolic rate with lots of activity. So mammals tend to be very mobile creatures and they have a lot of different biochemical processes going on inside the body. So some of these can be categorized into respiration to produce energy, thermoregulation, so controlling our temperature by means of different chemical reactions. Obviously mammals are continuing to grow through most of their life, and we've also got processes like repair and protein synthesis. And because of all of these processes, the amount of oxygen that's being consumed is quite high, and the amount of waste products which is being produced, like CO2, is quite high as well. So we have to have a gas exchange system like our lungs to be able to deal with an efficient exchange. So to deal with these constraints and demands, we've evolved the lungs, and these are found in the mammals. So the lungs are found in the chest, and the general area that they're found within is defined as the thorax, going from the neck to the abdomen. So the diaphragm is found here underneath, and what you can see is that the lungs are encased in a protective rib cage, and we obviously have two lungs, one for each side of the body. So what we're going to be doing is going through the lungs, general anatomy, and the features found in the lung, and how it's adapted for an efficient gas exchange system with our blood, which can then deliver these nutrients around the body. So let's talk about where the lungs begin and we'll talk about the larger tubes that lead into the more detailed parts of the lung. So these are the trachea and the bronchi. And these are the tubes that connect the lungs to the mouth. So if you think about the mouth as the sort of portal of entry and exit for these gases, as we breathe in, the mouth allows oxygen to enter the throat or the oral cavity. And as we breathe out, we allow carbon dioxide to escape the body. And the first place that these gases get to is a large tube which goes down our neck and that's known as the trachea. And then as the trachea descends down, it divides into two main tubes which are known as the two bronchi. And the symbol for this is two bronchus. So these tubes are quite large tubes and they can be seen in gross anatomy or larger scale anatomy. And they contain some cartilage in the shape of some C-shaped rings and they line the tube all the way down. And the purpose of this cartilage is that cartilage is quite a stiff tissue, it's quite a hard material, and it basically provides support whilst also allowing a bit of flexibility as well. So the way that the tubes are arranged is obviously just with a sort of common circular cross section. And then running the length of the tube, we have these C-shaped cartilages that run one after another around the front of the tube. So the reason that we're calling them C-shaped is that because at the back of the tube, they're actually deficient and there's nothing there. So they're not complete rings of cartilage, they're just a C-shaped bit of cartilage, which kind of looks like a horseshoe like this. So the purpose of this is to provide support, so they keep the airway open, so they keep the airway flowing with air, but they also allow flexibility as well, because if you imagine, they can bend and be pushed, which means that we can move our neck left and right, and we can also expand the tubes as well, so it can expand and become smaller too. So the cartilage is a really important feature of the trachea and the bronchi, and without them it would be a very weak and inflexible collapsing tube. So here we've got a histological diagram or a micrograph of the bronchus, and the trachea would have very similar features to this, and this is how you would see it under a microscope. So what we've got here is we've got the epithelium that's facing the lumen of the tube. So the lumen, remember, is the space of the tube where the air is flowing. So this area is what we call ciliated epithelium. And ciliated epithelium is basically a row of epithelial cells that consist of cells which have cilia on the top facing the airway. So these small hairs that face the lumen of the airway, and they basically aim to waft mucus, dirt and pathogens towards a particular direction. And we'll be talking about this in a few slides time. 
As well as ciliated epithelium, we've got some smooth muscle. So this area here, where you've got these kind of diffuse red looking cells, is the smooth muscle. And smooth muscle aims to just control the diameter of the airway overall, and it can contract and relax to increase or decrease the airflow running through the tube. And this area here is what we call the cartilage. So this refers to the cartilage discs or the rings that are running around the tube. And as we've just said, the smooth muscle is what allows the constriction of the tube to reduce the airflow. So this is a really important response. So if you can imagine, we've got one of our tubes here, which is allowing air to flow through it. The smooth muscle basically lines some of the outside of the tube. So you can imagine we've got muscle fibers running in different directions over the tube. So if you imagine the smooth muscles to contract, what they do is they shorten in length and the tube becomes a lot narrower. This might be useful if we've started inhaling some pollen or some dust and the lungs are starting to respond to the idea that this is very harmful. So what they want to do is contract the tube so that there's less air running through and therefore less risk of damage. In asthma, people have quite hypersensitive airways and this happens a bit too much and they contract to a point where they're so narrow that people struggle to breathe. And also they can relax, which allows the opposite to happen, in which case the airways become wider and they can allow more air to flow through. As we just said, the walls are lined with ciliated epithelial tissue, and the tissue contains not only the epithelial cells, but goblet cells as well. So goblet cells can be found as a sort of goblet-shaped cell, and they tend to be packed with mucus because the purpose of these cells is to produce mucus. So these structures here are the hairs that you can see on the ciliated epithelia. So these are the cilia, and the goblet cells lie in between the epithelial cells, and these aim to produce mucus. So going into a bit more detail of what the goblet cells can do, the goblet cells secrete mucus and the purpose of this mucus is to trap dirt and pathogens. So again what we've got is we've got the lumen of the airway here with the epithelial cells and the cilia and now and then you come across a goblet cell and the goblet cell basically sends the mucus up into the luminal area and it produces this kind of thick layer of mucus over the lining of the airway. And as we breathe in or out, we obviously can get exposed to a lot of dust and a lot of pathogens, and these get trapped in the mucus. And the purpose of this is to stop them from entering our epithelial tissue, because these want to invade and get into the epithelium and cause damage. The mucus acts as a barrier to the pathogens and the dirt, and it keeps us from being harmed. Once it's been trapped, it needs to then be removed. So the purpose of the cilia, which is found on the top of these ciliated epithelial cells, is that they waft the mucus, which is a specific word sort of describing their movement, up and out of the airways towards the mouth. So they sort of beat in time with each other in the same sort of synchronized pattern. And all of that mucus that's built up on top of the cells gets moved to the mouth where it can be swallowed into the stomach. The reason it gets swallowed into the stomach is because then in the stomach, the acids can break down the mucus and all of the pathogens and render them harmless. So now after the bronchi, the tubes continue to divide smaller and smaller and smaller until they get to the deeper parts of the lung. And now we have the tubes known as the bronchioles. So these lead from the two bronchi all the way down to the alveoli, which are the smallest units. So mainly they consist of smooth muscle and they have some epithelial cells as well. The cartilage varies in amount, but here we have a light micrograph of the bronchioles. And I'm just going to take you through different parts that you can see. So here is the center of the tube, so this would be the lumen which is where the air is flowing. And this folded up structure is the epithelium that lines the lumen. And remember, epithelium is a type of tissue that always faces the outside world. So it can be found in the airways, it can be found in your ears, the nose can be found in the digestive tract as well. So it's always a tissue that faces something that's coming from the outside world. So this is the epithelium. And then around here, you can see these red sort of strand looking fibers. And these are the smooth muscle fibers. And those fibers have the same function that they had in the trachea and the bronchi. They can contract and relax to alter the diameter of the tube. Larger bronchioles can have some cartilage, just like the larger tubes did, but most of them do not have cartilage. And actually, bronchioles tend to be defined by not having cartilage. And then finally, once we get through all of the bronchioles, we get to the smallest unit of gas exchange, which is the alveoli. And the lungs consist mostly of millions of alveoli, and this is the end of the pathway. The epithelium that surrounds the alveoli is a squamous epithelial tissue and it contains a lot of elastic fibres. So if we were to zoom in here we've got the bronchiole coming down 
and sort of coming to the end of its journey. And then there's some smooth muscle as well. And then it enters this tube and you get lots of little air sacs which are alveoli. And one alveolus is how you would say the singular version. So the epithelium of the alveolus, if you zoom in here, it's just got a two cell thick boundary which is made up of squamous epithelia, which is very, very thin cells, allowing good distances for gas exchange. So here we have another micrograph showing now the structures of the alveoli. So the alveoli look quite dispersed here. They're not perfectly round as you would imagine, but they look like a sponge. And you can see all of the white areas are the air. And so each one of these is an alveolus. So we can point to several just to give you an idea of what they look like. And some will be larger than others. This large area here is not an alveolus, this is the bronchiole because it's much larger and it's kind of leading into all of these alveoli where it will then end. And then the other feature that you can see here are there's a couple of red areas and these are the blood capillaries because as they've taken the specimen the blood inside has clotted and it's remained sort of stuck in the vessel so this is a blood capillary. So the alveoli is where the actual gas exchange occurs in the lung and they have to be very well adapted so that gas exchange is made as efficient as possible. One of the most important features they have is that they cover a large surface area and they have a good blood supply. So obviously you could just have one area which is one single sphere and that would be, still be good because it gives lots of surface area for gas exchange. But it's actually better in the same volume to pack more surface area and in as much as you can. So we have this kind of bunch of grape-like structure where there's lots of alveoli packed into one area. And so this maximizes the surface area. And obviously we want lots of blood vessels running over the alveoli because we want the air and the oxygen to enter the blood and we want the CO2 to leave the blood. And we want it to happen in as many places as possible. So the increased amount of blood vessels also maximizes the exchange. It wouldn't be any good to have alveoli that weren't surrounded by blood vessels because that air has now got nowhere to go. And another important feature of the alveoli is that it has a short diffusion distance for the gases to travel. So now we have the oxygen entering the alveolus from the air, and we have CO2 trying to leave the blood out of the alveolus. But if this distance was too large, it would be very difficult to get these gases into the blood and out of the blood very, very quickly. So the actual pathway here is only two cells thick. We've got the cells that line the alveolus, which are the squamous epithelia, and then we've got the walls of the blood vessels, which are the endothelium lining the blood vessels tube walls. So the gases now only have to pass two sets of cells to get through to the blood or vice versa. And because this is only two cells thick, it's a very short diffusion distance, which makes this gas exchange nice and quick. And as we said at the beginning, mammals are very, very active species. So we want this to happen as quickly as possible. And therefore this short diffusion pathway allows this to happen. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you are looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the snap revised smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.